Because we were so intense with school and track and managing our health and all these things, we finally had a summer where it was basically time to either get an internship or a job. And we we had this captain that we knew in the Keys and we had fished with him quite a few times. And he's like, hey, like if you want a summer job with me, I'd love to have you. And we were just so... I, I think it was just such an easy yes. We were like, yeah. that is sounds so fun. Like, yeah. my life is, I'm, I mean, I'm, I, we had always done everything, I guess you could say, perfectly. Like, it was like, we did the, the shadowing, we did the research, we did all these things, and then it was just like, finally, like, a summer break, let's just do something fun this summer. Mm-hmm. And being not sure about going to medical school, we both said, well, why don't we try exposing ourselves to other areas of life? My name is Emily. My name is Amanda. We're the Gale Force Twins, and welcome to the Tom Rowland Podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show today. Today's show is with some very impressive young ladies named the Gale Force Twins. Emily and Amanda are former D1 athletes, and we talk about how they used that discipline and dedication that they used to become uh, high-level pole vaulters on the national level and D1 level uh, to also become charter fishing guides and transitioning into the YouTube space. There's a lot of great information here and uh, these young ladies are really getting after it and they are legit. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with the Gale Force twins, Emily and Amanda. All right. I'm here with Emily and Amanda, the Gale Force twins. How are you girls doing today? We're good. How are you? Well, uh, everything's going great. How's the fishing? It's, it's good. good. Yeah. yeah. Fishing's really good. It's pretty windy right now. We got a hurricane coming our way, but that's okay. <laughs> I know. So you're in the Keys right now? Yes. We're in Big Pine Key. Okay. That's interesting. You, you've you kind of moved around. Um, at one point, I saw that you were moving your charter charter business north, and then now, are you back in the Keys, or what's, what's the status? Um, it's been pretty fluid, I would say. We... We grew up originally in Weston, Florida, which is 45 minutes west of Fort Lauderdale. So we did run charters or we we do do run charters out of Pompano, but we have our business licenses in Monroe County and Broward County. So when the whole COVID started happening, we actually kind of came down to the keys to get away from everything and focus more on filming. And with that, we've been able to run charters down here as well. Right. Yeah. I mean, basically we started in the keys and then moved back up to Fort Lauderdale back home and been charting out there. But once COVID happened, we just came back. (laughs) So why did you think that the keys were better? I mean, because the keys were closed for a long time because of COVID. So why did, why did that seem like a more logical place to be? Um, I mean, for us, once COVID happened, we lost so many of our charters. I think we lost all of them. Uh, Initially, initially we lost all of our charters for the summer. And so at that point we asked each other, well, what's the next step for our business? And we, that was when we decided to really full time dive into YouTube okay. and Facebook videos. And we said that the keys was probably the best place for that. So we initially came here to focus on filming. Actually, it was right. a filming decision, not necessarily a charter decision. Right. That's interesting. It's a, it's a little bit different kind of uh different kind of a strategy to either, I mean, if you're making videos to promote your charter business or you're making videos to entertain people on YouTube, it's a little bit different strategy, I think, don't you? Oh, definitely. Definitely is. So how's the, how's the YouTube going? I see that you've got a lot of subscribers and, uh, and a lot of loyal fans. Has that grown a lot since you started to really dive into it since COVID? Yeah. When COVID started, we're very, we like to be busy. We're very active people. So we decided we were going to give ourselves full-time jobs, no matter what we were doing, we had to be working full-time. So because we didn't have charters, we decided to do videos and starting COVID, we had a thousand subscribers. And then within three months, we're over just over three months now, we're at 13,000 on YouTube. And our Facebook has, we actually, Facebook now offers the same program that YouTube offers where you can upload 10 minute videos. So we upload the same YouTube video to Facebook, to our Facebook watchers and viewers. And the same thing, I think we went from 20,000 on Facebook to 40,000 within 
a short amount of time. So the growth is definitely there. Wow. Why do you think that, um, that Facebook is doing better for you? Do you have any idea? Any, I mean, can you tell from the comments or can you tell who the audience is on one versus the other? I think that that's actually a really good question. Where Facebook came out with Facebook watch. So it's definitely new. And I think Facebook is trying to compete with YouTube and um, we've always had a big following on Facebook. And I think part of that has to do with our first charter boat job. That captain had a big Facebook page and he kind of showed us the ins and outs of Facebook. So mm-hmm. that's kind of where we started our social media, even before Instagram. And I think that Facebook, for some reason, you just seem to get more likes and followers, but we have noticed that you don't necessarily get the same watch time that you get on YouTube. Mm-hmm. So YouTube, you'll get minutes of watch time. We've noticed Facebook for the most part, you might get a minute or two. I think Facebook's trying to compete and we've noticed that since we noticed that Facebook just got on Facebook watch, we said that, well, let's get in on the ground floor and start now. Yeah. So that's kind of why, even though YouTube actually, we get way more watch minutes. We know that Facebook is just starting and we want to be the first ones in. So we're doing it on Facebook as well. That's super important. Uh, every success we've had with social media has to do with getting in early and getting on that initial wave of whatever that is, you know, Instagram live or Instagram, um, uh, uh, IGTV was like that for us. And then, um, uh, you know, you, you see people with TikTok, and then you see the big, the biggest wow. YouTubers, like they, they all kind of got started at the same time, especially in the fishing, uh, yeah. business. Yeah. They, they kind of all rode that wave and you see some people get started and, and really build up quickly right now, but it was much easier, I think, to build up an audience, uh, at one point when everyone is just like getting on YouTube and looking for something to watch and looking for places to subscribe. That seems like that was, that was kind of the right time. So I, I, I believe what you're saying is like, as soon as, as soon as there's something new, you kind of jump on it. And if it, if it takes off, you're in a great place. And if it doesn't, then yeah, you just move on to the next one. Yeah. Do you do, you yeah. do TikTok? Yeah, we, we did get on TikTok. Um, I don't really understand TikTok, but we do it anyways. <laughs> I don't either. My daughter told me I can't be on TikTok. So I, it I, is- I mean, we had, we noticed it's a younger TikTok is a younger generation because we had a message from a girl on TikTok that she said, Oh, my dad follows you on Instagram. I'm so glad I found you on TikTok. Mm-hmm. Some of those were funny. Like, that, wow, that just like aged us. Yeah. I was like, wow. <laughs> so we, on TikTok, we upload like 60 second versions of our YouTube videos or just fun little snippets. We haven't things. really gotten into the whole TikTok dancing or anything. Right. We're, we use it more as a feeder account. We just use platforms. it to promote our YouTube channel. And like, it's doing well. I mean, our TikTok has, I think, 17,000 followers. So I don't even feel like put that much effort into it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk about your, your backstory and, and kind of how you got into the charter business. Um, I, I did a little research on the on, um, between the time that we first started talking and then, and today, and, uh, I learned all kinds of stuff about you. First of all, both of you are elite athletes, which is very interesting to me. Um, pole vaulters, right? Yes. And, uh, you took that to a national level and D one college level. Yeah. And, um, we won medals. And when we were at UM, um, we won indoor, we won indoor ACCs. Um, two of the years we were there, and I think they went on after that to for two win more for years. two more years. So they won indoors, indoor four races in four row. years in a row. Wow, that's awesome! I mean, D one level uh, athletics is is really um, that's very challenging. I mean, that's yeah. like a talk about you wanted to have a full time job. That tell me about the schedule when you're a when you're a D one track athlete. What's your daily schedule like? It was pretty intense. Um, pretty much we practice six days a week and four of those six days we was started twice at, a day it was twice a day. We'd start, we'd have weights at six in the morning. So we'd be getting up. We always like to get up significantly earlier than when we had to be somewhere. So we'd get up at four 30, four 45, even though weights didn't start till six. And we only live two miles from campus, but that was because, you know, we like to have a full breakfast and be like really ready and awake to get there. And then we had class after our morning weights practice. And then we had our afternoon practice, which was usually around two or three o'clock, which was more of our event focus, like running on the track. And then because of our majors, we were pre-med degrees. A lot of the teachers were doctors that came over at nighttime from the med campus. And then we had night class and we would have night class till sometimes eight, nine, nine, ten o'clock. So we had like classes that ended at, I think like we had a lab, I think on Tuesdays that ended at 9.50. So you'd start your day at four o'clock in the morning go to weights for an hour or two, 
go to class from eight to three, go to practice from three to six, six and then go to class from seven to nine. It was pretty intense. It was one of the craziest times of our lives, schedule wise. Yeah. I mean, it was hard to keep up. We drank a lot. We don't drink coffee anymore. At the time, we drank a lot of coffee. <laughs> and I mean, I loved it though. I loved how rigorous it was. And I think we thrived on that. We thrived on that intensity in the schedule. Yeah. And that's a, a perfect uh, training ground to become a, a professional charter captain because those are similar hours uh, in my experience that, you know, four o'clock in the morning till about 10 o'clock at night. That's about the day of a, of a charter guide. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> um, so how did you, how did you get into pole vaulting originally? That's actually kind of a funny story. We originally, we ran, we, our dad was a runner for a long time, distance runner. And when we were in middle school, we said, Oh, I want to be a pole. Or no, we said, I want to, I want to be a runner. So we started running on the track team in middle school. And then high school is when typically you start seeing pole vault events show up at track meets. And we saw pole vaulters. And when we were friends, they were actually um, cheerleaders. And there was a girl on the cheerleading team. And she was a pole vaulter. And we are like, wow, that's so cool. I want to pole vault. And she said to us, she goes, it's really hard. You probably can't do it. <laughs> oh. And we just kind of, we knew we were really competitive and athletic. And we were kind of like, well, if she can do it, we can do it. Yeah. <laughs> and it was the first day of track practice or track tryouts in high school. We went to the coach. We were like, we want to pull ball. And he was like, you just have to wait. It's not, not ready for that yet. But, you know, you need to prove yourself, whatever. So we kept proving ourselves every day, showing up, running, however much they asked us to run before finally they let us start pole vaulting. And what's interesting is in the first, I think, three months of pole vaulting, the coach told oh, her. Yeah, he told me that I probably shouldn't do it. I wasn't very good at it at all. I, I struggled with... Basically, so I'm left-handed, but my I'm like right body, which is <laughs> odd. Like my I'm right leg. I guess you kick say. with your right foot and yeah. you're left-handed. Right. So I, I remember like struggling in the beginning, like jumping off the wrong foot and doing all these like really weird things. But we were we were athletic. It's just that for some reason it didn't come naturally to me. And then the coach looked at me after a meeting. He's like, I really think you should try something else. <laughs> and I was being so upset, and I like wanted to cry about it. And then that was. Right after that happened, we found a club team and I went to the club coach. We got, got out of our high school because typically high school pole vault coaches, it's such a specific event that the high school pole vault coach is usually someone that did it in college, but doesn't do it super seriously, kind of. So we went to a club team. And then I think within like a week of being on the club team, it was obvious that I was going to, we, we were going to go somewhere with it. I yeah, guess I'd say that once we found this club team. So we were going to high school in Fort Lauderdale and this club coach was in Melbourne, Melbourne, Florida. So like three hours away. And we would drive up on Saturdays and Sundays, three hours for practice. And I mean, this coach was so good. He had athletes from all over the state doing the same thing to come turn with him on weekends. That, that was once we found this coach, he became a big part of our lives and we would go up, we would train and very quickly we said, okay, wow, I really like pole vaulting and I could see this going somewhere. So what do we have to do to pole vault in college? Nice. And what was the difference, do you think, between that first coach that said you had no possibility of doing this and the second coach that believed in you? What was the, what was the difference? What, I mean, is it one that he just had more skills as a coach and could see things or did he just spend more time with you or what was it that was the difference there? I think it was all of it. He kind of became like a mentor to us as a person. He was a really good person. He was, he was a skillful teacher. Well, I'll add that when you, just from my perspective, when you pull up, you jump off of your left foot and we were at a track meet and this was when she was struggling and she was jumping off of two feet to pull up and like, like you're not supposed to do that. It's like, she, the last it's like the last thing you're supposed to do. to do. And she jumped eight feet off of two feet, which right. is as a beginner. So the original coach, the high school coach was like, I don't know how to coach a kid that jumps off of two feet. <laughs> and the club coach was like, this kid jumped off of two feet and jumped eight feet. That's incredible. Right. I see the athleticism there. You yeah. just have to fix it. Well, that's what yeah. I was kind of, that's what I was kind of getting to is like one coach has more experience and that can see that that's not a problem. That's like, if you can do that, if I can teach you the right way, you're going to be awesome. And then the other yeah. coach yeah. is like, that's a disaster. I've never seen anything so bad in my life. You should just quit. You should just quit, you know, but, um, and it's funny because then you, you were state champ, right, Emily? 
Yeah. Actually. So you ended so, up at the first, like taking off a little bit more. And then I guess you guys competed a ton back and forth, right? Yep. Yep. So my freshman year of high school, obviously I wasn't that great at pole vaulting. And then my sophomore year was when I met this club coach. And within three months, he took me from eight feet getting last at every track meet to winning the state title. I got first place my sophomore year. And then junior year was when I, mean, I, I, I caught up. started to catch up and I was more, she was more of an athlete that she went from eight feet to 12 feet really fast. And I was the athlete that was slow and going eight, six, nine, nine, six, ten, just like jumping at every single bar and just kind of, I was like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And we kind of had different jumping techniques. Emily was more of, which I would consider like a speed jumper. She was fast and explosive. And I was a little bit more technique oriented. And I wanted to know like every detail, make sure I was taking off in the right spot and had the right grip and all of those details. And by her senior, junior year, Emily got first at States and I got second. So that was a really cool experience for us. Yeah. And yeah. then by senior year, she beat me. I beat you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so when, when, you know, I don't know if, if, if this is of interest, but I was a pole vaulter for two years. Um, and the reason that the the track coach, I was a soccer player and the, the track coach kind of came over and was like, you know, you should try this. And I had a friend that was a pretty good pole vaulter. And the reason that they came to me and asked me that is because I had good upper body strength because I was a wrestler. And so I could actually pole vault where some of the kids couldn't pole vault. They wanted to, but they couldn't really because they just weren't strong enough. So in your athletic background, why, why did you have the upper body strength to be able to, to excel at that? Were you like gymnast before or did you, what was it that gave you that upper body strength? Yeah. I mean, we pretty much were, we were gymnasts our whole lives up until middle school. And then in middle school, we were doing gymnastics and track because we wanted to start running because our dad was a marathon runner, like we said. And our mom would pick us up from track practice with dinner in the car and like a change of clothes. And then we'd go from track practice to gymnastics practice. And then by eighth grade year, our mom told us when you go into high school, you have to choose either only in school sports or only out of school sports. She's like, I can't do both. I mean, (laughs) but yeah, we started off in gymnastics and a lot of pole vaulters come from backgrounds with upper body. So gymnasts, like wrestling, like you said. Um, yeah. Well, you have that body awareness of where, you know, where you are on a, on a plane where you, where your body is, and then you have the the strength and the skill to, to, to move your body, you know, the way you want to other people think about it. Like, I know that's what I'm supposed to do, but their body just doesn't do it <laughs> either because they don't have strength or they don't have spatial awareness of like where, where their body is. But I figured it was probably gymnastics as a background. And then, yeah. uh, but your first track coach just it, it, I mean, I don't know. It's kind of disappointing that well, a coach would be just like, you're just terrible at this. You shouldn't, right? you know. shouldn't go, you know, but it seems like, it seems like, um, all of that, like it's making a lot more sense to me that, you know, you start with a gymnastics background, which is a very demanding sport, really tough. And then track and field and taking, taking pole vaulting to a, a D one level that makes a lot more sense in where you are now as a, as charter captains that, I mean, that's a demanding, that's a demanding schedule as well. And so a lot of people would get into fishing and they're like, man, I had no idea it was going to be this much work. I mean, 4 a.m. until 10 o'clock at night and then the bilge pump breaks and now you got a flashlight between your teeth at 11 and you're fixing a bilge pump, you know, trying to get ready for the next day. That takes a lot of dedication and, and, um, determination to, to make that happen. So it's making a lot more sense now. That I, that I see just what your background was. That's pretty cool. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So along the way, um, you, you also had some other challenges, right? Like there was a health issue. Is that correct? Do you feel like talking about that at all? Yeah, yeah. of course. Um, I guess, um, I feel like I haven't told this story in a while. Um, when we were both in high school, it originally started with me I was training, um, was I a sophomore? Sophomore. Wow, it's been so long since I told this story. I was a sophomore in high school and I just started feeling very weak and fatigued on the track and being super athletic as we are, it was just very odd. Like, well, you're very, like, you're not just dehydrated. You're not lazy. There's something odd. And it was, um, our pediatrician, he was like, let me just run some blood work. And he decided to run a test for your immunoglobulins. And it came back very, very severely low. 
So your immunoglobulins are so what? What would that mean? Yeah, tell me what you what right. you're about to yeah. say. So <laughs> your immunoglobulins, your IgGs, IgA. Um, there's a whole slew of them, and they're what helps fight your body against infections and diseases. And um, one of the biggest things that they found with me was that my immunoglobulins, basically, let's say I get the flu and normally your body builds up antibodies. And so you don't get it again. Well, my body didn't have the ability to build up those antibodies. So I would get it again and again and again. And things started to make sense because when I was in fourth grade, I got my tonsils taken out from having so many strep throat infections. And as like, we started to get more into this blood work and figure out what was happening. Um, we went and saw a specialist in Miami, University of Miami Health System. And he was the one, an immunologist, an allergist. And he was the one that basically explained everything to us what was going on. And being identical twins, they said, well, if a man odds has, are, yeah. the man has something going on, let's check out Emily too. And at the time, Emily was a little bit more asymptomatic. Yeah, my story, it's really, it was a really hectic couple of years of our lives because while she was getting diagnosed with the proper name, it's a CVID, also known as hypogamma globulinemia. <laughs> but CVID stands for Common Variable Immune Deficiency. So basically, I lacked, in layman's terms, I lacked antibodies. It's probably the easiest yeah. way to put it. And my body does not have the ability to create antibodies at all. Hmm. So basically, she, when, when you go and get your blood work, when you go and get, when you donate blood, I'm trying to say, plasma, your blood plasma is what she needs. So basically, as this was happening, I was a sophomore in high school and they said, well, you're going to need donated blood plasma in order to live, period. Like that was like- Like on the, on the regular or just like once? No, on the regular. Oh, wow. To this day, it's a regular thing. Every week. Every week. I, um, am, I rely on donated blood plasma to live, which sounds <laughs> scary. But um, when it happened, I was a sophomore. And even though I felt fatigued and tired, it was hard for me to wrap my brain around it. I was like, but I, I'm, I'm healthy. Like I run track, I go to school. Like I, I don't need donated blood plasma. <laughs> um, so I went in for my first, you call them treatments. And it's basically, so if anyone doesn't know, blood plasma is like the consistency of molasses. <laughs> it's not just like yeah. water you put through an IV. It's very thick and you have to get infused with it either subcutaneously, which means through your fat, or you can do it intravenously, but you have to do it over a three to four, sometimes six hour window. You can't just like go and get a shot. So I did my first treatment and the specific treatment that I had, I ended up having a basically a severe reaction to it and ended up with meningitis after the fact. Oh gosh. So it, was, it was very traumatic being like 15 and feeling healthy. I, my parents kind of we talked to the doctor and we were like, well, maybe we should wait a year for Amanda to recover and see like where she's going on her health levels and just monitor her blood work before we all of a sudden say like, okay, no, you need this. Cause my body wasn't really accepting it. So a year later I was continuing track and everything was fine. But basically that next year was when my condition really started to deteriorate and I struggled. My biggest struggle was muscle fatigue just like extreme fatigue all the time. And even though I wasn't getting like necessarily sick all the time, I had constant fatigue. It was hard to go to practice. And it was, it was like an emotional time for us because um, like we asked for an elevator pass for her to use at the school, but the nurses at the school and the people behind the counter see this perfectly healthy looking child. <laughs> You're on the track team. team. <laughs> you know, like, and, yeah, yeah. Right. You, you just like, want to stay title. Why do you need an elevator pass? Right. Like I was the kind of kid that, our um, high school had four fours and I had class on the fourth floor and that you could not get an elevator pass unless you were like on crutches or on a wheelchair. And, but I would go to practice every day because I was so committed to track and I was telling the, the nurses at school, I was like, I could really use an elevator pass because it fatigues me so much. I can't even get to track practice, but if I could like get managed, manage it through my day, I can perform right. at track practice. And it took some convincing, but I was get an elevator pass. <laughs> and that was the year that the doctors finally said, it's really time for you to start focusing on these infusions. You can't keep going without them. It's clearly affecting you. So I was back balancing all that. And basically what we've had to do is come up with a routine that works for me so that my body doesn't um, freak out every time I get an infusion. So what I have to do is I do weekly infusions of small doses 
over time as opposed to doing a monthly infusion. But she says small doses, but they take like six hours. They take six so hours? No, no, they're like four hours now. Okay, four. So yeah. what, what kind of a, a facility does this? Like the do doctor's office or you do it at home? Mm -hmm. I do it at home. When I first started, you go into like, um, like a, a hospital and you go to normally the people with blood problems section. I don't know what it's called. We're the same section where they're doing the cancer treatment. Okay. Yeah. That stuff. And, um, then in high school, my mom started doing it for me at home and then she started doing it for me in college, in college. And then we were freshmen in college and she was out with friends and I was in the dorm alone. And I was just kind of like, I'm tired of relying on other people to help me do this. I'm just going to do it myself. Mm -hmm. So I just like, like bit my lip and like poke myself with the needles. <laughs> and I was like, this is so scary. But, um, <laughs> that's something that I've had to basically create. It's a normal part of my life. Um, every single week I have to infuse myself with donated blood plasma it takes around four hours and I do it subcutaneously. So I'm doing it either like in my stomach or just in like, you can do it in your legs, just like different areas of your body that you can put a little, like two, two or three needles, Yeah. I sit on the couch and I edit videos. I watch Netflix. So after you do that, that, after you do that, do you feel a lot different? Um, not, I mean, usually after you do it, you're kind of in pain for a couple of days, you're sore, it hurts. Um, but the biggest thing is the best way to explain it is imagine like a sink that's filled with water, but the drain is unplugged. So if I don't do my infusions, mm. the, the sink is just going to yeah. drain. If I do my infusions, the sink, the water running, just the, if I do my infusions, the water's running, the sink continues to fill up. Right. And so. If I'm doing them regularly and I'm on top of it, for the most part, I'm very normal. I have to be careful with COVID going around. Um, I have to be careful with traveling and things like that. But I can live a normal life. And as long as I'm just careful and monitoring everything. Yeah. 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 I would imagine that the COVID situation, you, you have to be really careful. That's another reason why being in the Keys and like, are you guys on Big Pine? Is that where you are? Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I mean, you could go, you could be in Big Pine and not see anybody for a, a week. <laughs> we don't. We have no. Yeah. And basically, um, just Emily also has the yeah same situation, but her I, natural antibody levels are a little bit higher. Right. So I don't have to do them weekly like she does. Um, I basically monitor my blood levels. And if they get low, then I would be using an infusion. So naturally like she said my we call them our immunoglobulin levels they're just a little bit they're still not normal they're still significantly lower and actually if anything her on infusions is probably like healthier than me not on infusions but i'm not so bad to where doing them is a necessity because it is a big commitment in your life and maybe when i get older maybe as i age I might need to start doing them regularly. Yeah. But for is, now, is there some kind of like a, a strip test or some kind of something where you can test that real quick and know that you're low or high or, or where you are? How do you know? Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's blood work. It's blood work. Oh, like the through the doctor's like office. A, yeah. 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 Basically, it's something that like the levels will grow and fall over a period of time. So I have to do, if I do my infusions every day for every week for four weeks, my levels are going to be good if I, but it'll take probably a solid four weeks of not doing them for them to start to drop. Mm -hmm. So it's not like a immediate, immediate drastic up and down, up and down. Right. Um, the idea is to be consistent. Gotcha. And so these conditions, did that influence like what you planned on studying in college? I would say so. It, it's interesting because we were, we always were, I guess you could say geeky kids. We love science. Like <laughs> We scored really high naturally on science for our FCAT, like our state testing and things like that. So for us, it was kind of just like, well, I'm good at it. I like it. So I'm going to go into this. And I think part of the reason was because of what we were dealing with. It's funny because I hated going to doctors. I had this really bad experience with doctor's offices being, especially that first year when we were getting tested a bunch. They didn't know what was wrong with us for a while. I remember thinking like, I never want to be a doctor. And I don't really know what made us decide to go into I think biology. That we both knew we liked science, and we we say we as if like together we were like, what are we gonna study? 
we did make independent decisions. And I mean, just like our business, we coincidentally have all the same things and have all the same hobbies and interests. Um, I think science was just something we both knew we liked and having some kind of experience in hospital settings and in the medical settings was kind of like, well, maybe this is going to be a good fit for me was our thought going yeah. into it. So the first two years of college, we were biology majors, pre-med. And within two years in, we both kind of started to say, I don't know if medical school is for me. It's a huge commitment. And it wasn't the commitment we were afraid of, but it was, if I'm not sure, is right. the commitment a good idea? Yeah. Um, but at, the, at, the, at your uh, undergraduate level, I mean, you're a D1 athlete and you're in this incredibly competitive and, and demanding uh, major, like I would think going to graduate school and not being a, a D1 athlete at that point might be a vacation. I, I don't know, but I mean, you're, you're very smart to, to, to kind of question that. Like, if I don't know, is this the right thing to do? Because one time I met this girl and she went all the way through nursing school and she was actually applying for a job. She went all the way through nursing school and then she actually got out and became a nurse. And then she said, I just didn't, I had no idea what nurses did all day and I didn't like it. Like you went all the way through nursing school without ever interning in a hospital or seeing what was going on. And that's exactly what she did. She had great grades all the way going through. And then she gets out and goes into the profession and realizes, wow, there's a lot of red tape here. There's all these kind of things that I didn't really understand or realize that we were going to do with that. And, and so it was kind of a waste. And so I, I don't know. I think that uh, it is a huge commitment. Medical school. I didn't go to medical school. Obviously, I barely made it out of high school and into college. But uh, um, yeah, probably probably a good decision if you don't know. So does that lead you into fishing? Like the the fishing thing starts kind of in a where in college, like as a as a summer job. Yeah. Right. I mean, so basically, because we, because we were so intense with school and track and managing our health and all these things, we finally had a summer where it was basically time to either get an internship or a job. And we we had this captain that we knew in the Keys and we had fished with him quite a few times. And he's like, hey, like, if you want a summer job with me, I'd love to have you. Really? And Who, who's that? It was. Captain Marlin on the fish monster boats okay. in Cuba, AB Marina. And we were just so, I, I think it was just, such an easy yes. We we're like, yeah. that is sounds so fun. Like yeah. my life is, I'm, I mean, I'm, we had always done everything, I guess you could say perfectly. Like it was like, we did the, the shadowing, we did the research, we did all these things. And then it was just like, finally, like a summer break, let's just do something fun this summer. Mm -hmm. And being not sure about going to medical school, we both said, well, why don't we try exposing ourselves to other areas of life? Nice. And why not work on a fishing boat? And yeah. I don't think we didn't think anything of it. Other than I thought it was, was going to be a fun summer job. But then it was on that job that Captain Marlin was, um, he was telling us, you should get your captain's license. This would be great for you. And we were like, okay, sure. Like, <laughs> let's do it. So we studied for the exam. We got the sea time. And at the very least, I thought it'd be really good for myself. We, we just thought it'd be good on a resume. I mean, yeah. we, we weren't even that sure and as we continue to go through college and realize okay i don't want to go to medical school but then what do i want to do we decided to stay in the fishing world and i wouldn't even say it was by choice it was more of opportunities kept opening up and we had different captains reaching out in different opportunities or jobs we worked a series of fishing tournaments in the bahamas with skip smith who runs the custom shootout and skips tournaments and he reached out to us and he was like hey i'm always looking for people to help me with my tournaments and it was a seasonal job we were just graduating college and he was like you know if you need a job when you graduate call me so we that's graduated. a that's kind of a little bit of a pivot there like you were you were kind of actually in the fishing business like running charters and being on a on a charter boat and now you're going to start running tournaments like did you was there anything that made you want to like i don't know i kind of like being on the boat like we're going to be running tournaments now. Was there any hesitation there? Not, not for starting the job. I think initially we both just decided that, you know, it'd be a good networking opportunity for us just to be more around it in other avenues of it. But when we were working the job, it was definitely 
obvious that when all the boats went out every morning and we were back back in the dock, like, Oh, bye. bye. (laughs) Y'all have fun. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So uh, how long did that, how long did you do that for what? It was for about six months. We started working for skip in January because we graduated in December and the tournament started in April, May, end of May, early April, April, because it was our birthday. Yeah. And they were, they went April through June and we, did the job. I mean, we enjoyed it. It was great. We, I mean, the amount of connections we made at those tournaments in the Bahamas, amount of captains we met, we kind of realized, I think that was very eye opening all of a sudden to say, okay, so the fishing world is huge. And like, I knew that, but now all of a sudden I'm learning this charter. There's the charter side of it. There's the tournament side of it. There's the private side of it. There's the sport fish side, there's the center. And we were just kind of learning so much and just absorbing it all. And I don't even think at this point still, neither of us had any idea what the next step was. No. Yeah. Well, there's a point in, in, I don't know. Well, it certainly was in my career where I had no idea that you could be a professional fisherman, that you could be a guide, that you could be an outfitter. I didn't know any of that stuff. I'd never really took a guided trip when I was a kid. And um, it wasn't until maybe my second or third year in Wyoming as a trout fishing guide that I was around some people that were like, married and having babies and they were like this was their deal and everybody's asking me when I'm going to get a real job and I'm like well I don't it just kind of hit me I was like well I think this I think this is a real job yeah like they, they're they're doing it like they're they're making a living doing it and you know it, it was different out west because you know you would be able to do it for a for a period in the summer and then it would get cold or all the tourists would leave and then they would have to pivot and they would do like snowmobile guiding or, or hunt guiding, or, uh, they'd work at the ski mountain or something like that. And that wasn't really, I didn't really like that idea. And that's how I ended up in Key West was going, I tried to spend a winter in Jackson, Wyoming and it was really cold. Uh, so I went as far South as, as you could get, but there is that period where you kind of realize that, wow, this is actually something that I could do. And this is a real job and there's money to be made and you can sustain yourself and you can actually create a, a good lifestyle. When was it that you kind of came upon that um, realization? I think that the original realization was on, at that first job mm-hmm. where I was making money, getting paid every day. I hadn't graduated college yet and I was making more money than I like even knew that I could. I was like, well, I don't even have a degree. Like, right. why am I going through all of this? And I'm making enough money today. Right. And I think we were being so surrounded, we were in a very highly academic school at UM and being surrounded by like-minded people in that situation. Everyone's going to medical school, vet school, PhD programs. And it was like, my mind was narrowed and I didn't even know that there were other options out there until we stepped outside and was like, wait, you can do what for a living? Right. There's all these different jobs out there outside of even fishing that you can make a living for without having a degree. And it, it was just kind of shocking for us. And I think it was almost freeing. It was like, wait, you can work on the water. You can work in the air. People are pilots. You can work on the land. Like, there's so many different avenues that you can take if you're not strictly in academia. And so when you get that realization and you're like, and you get your mind kind of opened like that, what does that do when you go back to school? Are you still as motivated to to finish or do you kind of start like real some introspection there of like, are we doing the right thing or am I doing the right thing? You know? Yeah, we yeah. definitely had doubts about our majors. Um, but something about being a student athlete is every year you have to have a percentage of your degree completed in order to be eligible. So like freshman year, maybe it's 20%, sophomore year, it's 50%, junior year, 75. And we talked about changing majors, but if we did that, then we wouldn't be eligible as athletes. So we kind of hit a a point where we decided, you know what, like, I'm going to complete my degree. I'm going to do this. And then when I get out, that's when, if I want to go into a different avenue, we'll do that. But I would say that it was, we had that job right before our last year of college Mm -hmm. and definitely going back to school, the motivation just was not there anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, but we're still very competitive and, um, we still even as strong, still fit as strong. I mean, our, we were always straight A students and I was not the kind of kid that was going to throw yeah, it all away. I'll throw it all away. Last year. I don't really care. We worked right. so hard for our GPAs. And I so on, on your last year, are you as competitive in, in 
on the track and, and pole vaulting. Yeah. And, and that, I mean, it looked like, I don't know, but it, it looked like you were like approaching like a national championship. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, with, by the time, so we both finished track right around the same time, but it was my fourth season and I had a back injury, mm. which was, I had a bone bruise in my sacrum which is the bone above your tailbone and a bone bruise is mostly pain management. It was an overtime stress injury. So I could train through it and I could continue my season. And by my last indoor season, I said, okay, I really want to go out strong and I really want to perform and do well. And I did that. And then the outdoor season was around the corner and because we had transferred, I had rented it. So I had an extra season to continue and train. But I think at that point for me, it was kind of, I could put all my energy into continuing track outside of the collegiate level or focus on the next step. And for me, I personally was ready for the next step after performing so well at indoor conference, I had ended on a high note. And for me, that was the best place to end. I was like, I PR, I medaled, we won ACCs, we have rings. This is the perfect time to put the spikes away and put the poles away. I think you took a little bit longer. I definitely did. I didn't have, uh, like, I think also part of it too was having the injury. It was like, you don't want to have a bad back for the rest of your life just because you spent an extra year pole vaulting. Right. I didn't have any injuries like that. So it was harder for me because there wasn't like a reason to stop. Um, I, we definitely kind of looked into continuing pole vaulting outside of college. And that look, what does that look like? Olympics? Actually, yeah. So pole vaulting, it's actually kind of like golf where you can continue to improve and peak in your late twenties. So it's not like gymnastics where your Olympians are 16, 17 right. years old. Pole vaulting is such a technical sport that it takes a long time to get to the Olympic level and what you can do outside of college. Once you graduate college, if you're not already at the Olympic level, but if you're close to it, you can go train at an Olympic training center. And there's um, a big pole vaulting one in California um, some people go train in Arkansas and there's a couple places around the country where post collegiate athletes go and they train and they have jobs and that's how they take it to the next level. And sometimes it could and, take. Like, and so the, the next level, is there, is there a middle ground between the Olympics and, 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 and where you are there? Is there like a, um, some sort of a precursor to the Olympics? Yeah, it, it's kind of like the fishing world where you can be on professional teams. Yeah. It's same thing. You can be on the Nike team or the Adidas team and you and can you'll, compete internationally and you'll compete as a professional athlete. There'll be track meets that will have divisions from collegiate to professional and you'll compete in your division. So it, basically your life as an athlete would continue. The difference would be that you are now in the professional division competing against it's much more stiffer competition because you're with once you're outside athletes. of the co collegiate level you're considered when you go to a track meet you would compete in the open division right. the open division is typically people outside of college and you in, can and the open division will have anybody from someone that just graduated college to olympians that have already been at the olympics. olympics got it so what was the uh what was the decision like to to abandon that i mean it, well i don't know if it's abandon or if it's yeah. to to uh come to peace with you've taken it as far as you want to take it and you're comfortable moving on. Uh, it sounds think, more like it's like that. Yeah. I think that especially for me, pole vaulting, it, it brought so much joy to our lives and we had so many great memories that I genuinely believed that I would never find something that made me that happy. Mm. Like I genuinely, I really thought that. And I was like, if I walk away from this, like I'm losing a piece of me. And it was actually because it kind of overlaps like with our first job on the water that I started to find something that I was like, this is really cool. I really like this. So in a way, I feel like I kind of let go slowly. It was like having something ahead of me that I knew I really had a passion for and really enjoyed made it easier for me to walk away from that. I would say though, it did take a long time after choosing to finish track to really find something that made me as excited as a track meet did. It, even though we were fishing and we did have the jobs, I think that once we had dedicated 10 years of pole vaulting, once we had stepped away from it, we went into year one of fishing. Yeah. And in year one of fishing, you're not going to be at the same level of a year 10 pole vaulter. Right. So, well, what was it that, that kind of was the first indication that you had a similar amount of excitement uh, in the fishing world as a, as a track meet? 
<laughs> I really think it, it kind of happened over time. Um, I think that as we started to create names for ourselves in the fishing world, we started to get invitations to fish on different tournament boats mm-hmm. and different charter boats, and different private boats. But I think that I actually really enjoy getting into the tournament scene. And I was like, wait, like I can compete again. I can be competitive. I can win top lady angler. I can win biggest mahi. And I think seeing the tournament side of things made me really excited mm-hmm. and want to really start. I think that we're so competitive that getting to compete in fishing is what really made me excited about it. I would think that you would have to have it. I mean, yeah, yeah, we do. Even, even, you know, my, my history as a wrestler, when that went away, I didn't even realize what happened, but when I wasn't wrestling anymore, it's kind of like, you don't even realize that there's a, there's a giant hole in your life until mm-hmm. something comes along. And for me too, it was a, it was the fishing tournaments. And all of a sudden the first fishing tournament that I got into was just a little red bone tournament in the Florida Keys, but it wasn't just a little red bone tournament to me. I was like, this is it. Like there's a boat race. There's like, there's this, this whole ambiance of competitiveness and, and, uh, it's like, this is, this is it. And then take that to the professional level of the redfish tournaments and, and on and on. And that was really cool until I kind of felt like I had enough of that too. But that, you know, it, it showed me like, wow, I didn't even realize that I was missing this in my life. Mm -hmm. And now here it is again. And that was one of the reasons why I I found it to be so rewarding in the, in the fishing tournaments, even if I didn't do well in them, it's like, I'm surrounded by these people that are all trying to do well, just like in athletics. And I didn't even know that I was missing this. That's that obviously you all probably did know that you were missing it right away. uh, (laughs) You know, stepping away like that. Yeah. I think it's, I honestly also feel like it was partly like biological because your brain gets used to having weak rushes or daily adrenaline sure. rushes. Absolutely. Accomplish, accomplishments that when you stop, it's like, you're what's the, like, when am I going to feel that again? There's definitely a period of and like, I think it was the first year after we had accomplished that I started doing, I, I needed to do all sorts of adrenaline things. You can ask her, like we were in Hawaii, <laughs> we're doing, like shark dive. Like, we're going to go do the shark dive, like a cage free shark dive. I was like, we need to go do this. And I started doing all these adrenaline we, things. We tried getting into CrossFit. Um, we talked talk about getting into competitive powerlifting. I mean, after graduating, after finishing pole vaulting, we, we were, we were searching, we're searching. How did, the, how did, how long did the CrossFit last? That's one of my gigs. Know, it was a couple of months. It was like three months. I think I, my biggest struggle with CrossFit was that you're lifting such heavy weight at such a fatigued state mm-hmm. that I couldn't really wrap my brain around it. Being in track, everything was so technical that you would never want to do a power clean when you're it, It's just not even safe. So that was something that I struggled with a little yeah. bit. <laughs> well, what do you do now? I mean, a- elite athletes don't just stop training. Like, what do you do yeah. to stay? I mean, with such a, a, a demanding charter um, lifestyle, how do you stay in shape now? Well, I mean, we've gotten weights. into weightlifting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, since when we r- ran track at UM, we weightlifted four times a week. And that's the one thing that I've carried with me since running track. We have a gym membership at home in Fort Lauderdale. And then in the Keys, we have a yeah. squat rack, squat rack, barbells, lat pull down as much as we can, because I've really found that, I don't know, there's something about just feeling strong, no matter what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And I mean, we've gotten up in the morning before we, well, we do, we get up in the morning before charter sometimes at 420 and get a workout in and nice. then go on the Cause if you don't do it before we poop out by the end of the day. Yeah, I we're know. Morning. That's what I do. I'm a morning, morning. It has to be in the morning. I mean, besides that you're out in the sun all day long and then you come back and it's like, I'm going to take a, a five mile run at the hottest part of the day. Like that just doesn't, it doesn't get me. I, I've had to do it lots of times, but it's better if you can do it in the dark in the morning, if you have the discipline to get up and, and get it yeah. done. Yeah. But you also have to be strong to be a, a, a charter guide and you got to throw the net. You got, garbage cans full of, of ice. You've got all kinds of chum and everything, especially with what you're doing with offshore guides. Like what is, I mean, you're five foot two, five foot three. Is that right? So they're, okay. So, I mean, five foot four, five foot three, there are obviously some challenges there. I mean, you look at some of the charter guides in the keys and they're, 
they're big burly dudes that are real, real strong. And um, what about those challenges? Do you find that to be a challenge or do you work around it or how do you do that? I found that the biggest challenge when we first started working on boats, I don't know about you, but was actually a vertical challenge. <laughs> I have that same challenge. <laughs> Not a strength issue. I felt that I was strong enough to do a lot already. So that was never the issue. It was being having long enough arms to gap the fish, being able to reach the rod in the top rod holder in the tower, being able to see above everybody's heads on the charter to cast at the bait, at, sorry, to cast at the fish. And all the, cl- all the clients are like in front of me. I'm like, move, like I need to get through the way. Um, so I think for me, that was something that I struggled with, but very quickly learning how to climb helps. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's a problem on someone else's boat where you, there, there's not really an opportunity to move things around and change and customize things. But when you move to your own boat, you can, you can create it like you want, you know, as long as your clients aren't bumping their heads on the, on the rod holders, um, if you need them to be super low. Um, but tell me about moving to your own boat and to get, I mean, let's see, you worked for, um, you talked about working in Key West and working for Skip Smith. Have you worked for anybody else? Yeah, so it was actually right when the seasonal job with Skip Smith was coming to a close. We got a call from a charter company in Marathon, Two Conks. Okay, I know Two Conks real well. Yeah, and they were like, "We're looking to hire." We we, they wanted some female captains, so it was kind of like we said, it was just opportunities that we just said yes to. We didn't even think about it. Like we came home from that series of tournaments and told our parents we were moving to the Keys. We're like. (laughs) Yeah, I'm going. They were like, okay. Like, were they were they supportive of that? And I mean, the keys. I mean, you have a history of going to the keys, so your parents know all about what the keys are all about. Like, was that was that any sort of a challenge? Or I mean, and then there's the challenge of of finding a place to live in the keys, which can be very expensive and and yeah. uh, difficult at at times. So, what was that like? Um, I mean, they, thankfully, our parents were very supportive of the whole process. I think that they had seen how structured and and rigorous we were always with school that for them watching us go and take a fishing job was a breath of fresh air oh okay you yeah. need this go do it you, you they, need to do they were fun. actually the ones when we graduated college I was applying to all these internship programs within my degree and field and my mom was like stop <laughs> she's like you need to get a regular job I don't care what you do you need to work for six months before you apply to some other program of some sort and that was when we called Skip Smith to see if he was hiring and so it was just one thing like another and I think they were just happy to see us pursuing something without so much structure in our lives when you look back at that advice I mean you said before that your mind was so focused just on the academia and in this world of just like what whatever you were doing like track and 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 school was that really good advice for you to kind of open your mind um and having that come from your parents and having them say you know do something else like that was that turned out to be good advice yeah yeah i think for sure i mean for us i can remember since we were 18 choosing to be biology majors and be pre-med I still always in the back of my head said, what am I doing with my life? Like, what do I want to do with my life? And Mm -hmm. I think that it was something that I always struggled with was just when you feel like you could accomplish anything or you know, you could study any degree and, and pass. It was almost overwhelming to be like, I had to make a decision and narrow it down to one thing. Right. And that's funny. That's, that's, that's kind of funny. Like there is a freedom in knowing that you can do anything. Like you have obviously done that. You've got, you've excelled to a national level in a very competitive sport. You're a D one athlete. You're making four O at, in, in an incredibly competitive major and, and very difficult. And if you can do that, you can do anything. So now the world is wide open and limitless which I would imagine that that would, I've never been in that set. I'm not as smart as you all, but I've never, I I mean, I kind of have confidence that I can do anything too, but it's different when the world is wide open to you. And I mean, do you have a kind of a FOMO of like, well, fishing seems like it's what's going on right now, but like, is there something else for me? Not anymore. Yeah. I feel like if anything, pursuing fishing was, making sure that I didn't miss out. It was like, it was like, okay, this is what I need to pursue now because I'm young. I'm nimble. I'm athletic. 
And this is the field that if I don't try now, I was worried I would regret it or question or be like, what if 10 years from now? So I feel like we kind of ended up, we did take that risk. And that I think that for us, so we both knew that I could go to grad school and probably make a 4.0 and graduate and get the job and do all of that. And that was going to be easy for me. So we said, well, what's the challenging thing here? Let's go out on a limb and start mm-hmm. a fishing charter boat. So that was the challenging thing. The easy thing would have been grad school and a job. And we said, no, like I want to challenge myself and try something else. That's awesome. I mean, that's, that's really, that's really cool. And uh, so much of your story is making way more sense, like with this whole background and, and it's no wonder that you're having the success that you're having and, and that you're, you're leaving behind a, 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 a bunch of in, in your wake, you're leaving behind a bunch of really high quality outfits that you've gotten a tremendous amount of experience. And then you move on to, to get your own boat. And that's where you are right now, right? You're, you're, you have your own boat and you're, you were doing the charters, but then COVID hit. And now, now you're devoting all of your time to, to YouTube and, and social media. Yeah, that's basically what happened. I think that after working at two conks and I will give Jack a ton of credit for teaching us so much you need to know about fishing in the Florida Keys. I mean, we learned a lot. I think after working there, we had kind of acquired quite a few different skills between how to run a charter business, how to fish, how to do it all. And we were just kind of like noticing that there was really no family friendly, kid friendly, let's slow things down for you, um, charter boat, really anywhere. And that's when we said, well, why don't we do that? So we did (laughs) and we found a lot of success pretty quickly in our first summer. We were running three trips a week, which it was our first summer ever on our own. It's a lot. And in the meantime, we're actually, we also were working on drift boats in Key West and taking jobs here and there. Actually, one of my favorite jobs was the drift boat in Key West on the Gulf stream, actually. Okay. Um, I don't know why, like I loved it. (laughs) Something that we did. So we were, building this following at the same time. And along with running a successful charter business these days, you have to do social media. And I think the whole time that we've been in this industry, we've never looked at ourselves as charter boat captains. We look at ourselves as entrepreneurs. So it was always like, okay, where can we branch out from here? And obviously social media is a big part of that. And I think that running the charter boat was kind of, in the beginning, especially was like the meat and potatoes was where you could guarantee the income. But we always knew that we said, I, I don't, I want to be bigger than that. I don't want to be just a charter boat. I want to show other people that you could fish and not necessarily just on my boat. And that's where the social media and the YouTube videos really started to come in. We dedicate a lot of time to it. And when COVID happened, because of our immune problems, we've had to cancel a lot of our charters. Um, a lot of them got canceled originally on their own, but then we've actually slowed down on taking trips as well, just to be cautious. And it's very easy for, I personally don't feel afraid of COVID. Like I'm going to live my life and I'm going to take my chances, but I don't want to be stupid at the same time. Yeah. So that's when we said, well, this gives us almost the perfect excuse to a hundred percent commit ourselves to YouTube videos. And we said, I want to create videos that are educational and fun and something that anybody can watch. We want to keep our stuff PG and a mom can watch it. A kid can watch it. A dad can watch it. Everybody's going to enjoy it. They can learn something. And we've really found a lot of enjoyment out of showing. Basically, YouTube is such a huge platform, such a huge audience that we like showing it that anybody can fish on YouTube. Whereas with the charter, which I love chartering because it's very close and intimate, but I'm only chartering with the four people on my boat. Right. YouTube, I can show the world. Right. Well, that was, that was exactly what we started with the TV show is like, we're, we're only, we're, we're, our audience is one person on the front of a skiff basically. And yeah. the idea was, you know, I got some advice given to me by Shaw Grigsby and he was like, you, you are worth the size of your audience. So that kind of registered with me. I was like, okay, you're worth the size of your audience. So I started writing articles. I started taking photographs. I st- this is long before the internet existed. And then, you know, you start building this audience and it's like, okay, well, if I am worth my audience, wouldn't it be better to have more than one person on my boat? Like, and then that kind of led to the whole television show. And, um, 
then you just kind of share your passion with with the world and a lot more people all at the same time. So you're you're definitely onto something uh, there with your with your YouTube and and just your mindset there. It's pretty cool. Thank you. So if you are to kind of blue sky it from here, what uh, do you have goals? Do you have do you have things that you're working towards, or are you singularly? I mean, you seem like two people that that could easily have a singular focus and not look up from that singular focus for five or six years, just like you did in graduate, I mean, in uh, undergraduate school and in your track world and everything like that. But, or are you kind of keeping your eyes out for other opportunities or how to grow this? I mean, you're entrepreneurs for sure. So what, what does that look like now? Are you just singular focus on YouTube and, and that, or are there other things going on? Um, I mean, well, that's a very loaded question. <laughs> I think that right now we are, I mean, the whole idea is to continue to grow our business and grow our brand as big as we can. Just like you said, you're worth as much as your audience or however you were, you worded it much better. But um, we are still running charters carefully right now because of COVID and we're really focusing a lot on content creation. Mm-hmm. But I think that for us, we really want to just take this as far as we can and as high as we can and as big as a platform as we can get on to really just show people that this like we people need to get off their cell phones off the xbox they need to get outside get on the water and just be in a family environment um also along with what else you said about looking for other um things coming your way we do we look at it as raindrops in a bucket. So we're just putting raindrops in a bucket all the time. So that's chartering, that's YouTube. And another raindrop that we have, the larger raindrop that we have coming in our bucket is we're actually going to start coming out with a line of rods that we are getting custom made with our rod sponsor because we've been having charter clients want to buy our rods. And so far we've been selling them like from just the people that come on our boat. And we reached out to our rod sponsor, which is Fast and Enterprises. And we asked them like, hey, do you think what would... It, be to have like a small inventory of rods to sell to our subscribers and followers for people that want to get out there. And they were actually going to fly out to Washington in, in uh, October. We're, it's rain shadow, rain shadow rods. Mm-hmm. So we're going to start creating some kind of, I mean, I think we want to create the best offshore rod that can do it all. Mahi, tuna, um, just something that, cause it's so, I, you know, you go to Bass Pro or any store and there's 50 rods and there's, there's, on there's one, like 500 right, on one wall. Yeah. There's five walls and you're like, what do I do? Like, <laughs> you know, don't worry about the pound test or the length. I'm just going to sh- tell you, this is a great mahi tuna rod. So someone can just go and just know that they're going to go catch mahi and tuna and use it offshore. And same thing for snapper. This is a great snapper rod. You don't have to worry about, do I get the 10 to 15 pound, the 10 to 20 pound? Do I get the seven foot rod? Do I get the seven foot six rod? Like the, it's very overwhelming. And I mean, we definitely felt that way when we first were getting started. The first but getting started, it can be overwhelming. Now. Yeah. I mean, when, wow. when, when you know all kinds of things and, and, and I mean, there's just a lot of, a lot of options out there for everything, for everything, anything fishing tackle, there are a lot of options. And I think that that's one of the things that people do is like, well, we need something else to sell. Like, so let's yeah. make it five inches longer. Let's do it this way. Let's you know, make it lighter, make it heavier, make it whatever. And it does get very, very confusing. It hundred percent. But so to answer your question, I think we're always looking for the next opportunity and the next platform, but also continuing to focus on what it is. And a hundred percent, like we're for the next opportunity and the next platform for us, it's no matter what we know that we want to stay in the fishing vein. We're not necessarily like, Oh, I got to over there. Like, no, it's a hundred percent. We're in the fishing. This is what we want to do. And we just want to continue to grow and, um, inspire people to get outside, get fishing, you know, get kids out, get women out. It's, there's not a lot of women in the sport. A lot of them don't see themselves doing it. And we want to show them that they can do it too. You know, there's, um, there, there's a push for women to get into fly fishing. I think that's a little bit, uh, kinder, gentler kind of, Mm -hmm. uh, introduction into it. I mean, either wading, um, or in a drift boat, um, you know, it's fresh water, the fish are small, the flies are small, the rods are light. There's just so many reasons that that would be, in my opinion, less intimidating than what you're doing. Um, (laughs) how do you, how do you kind of see the, 
I guess it would be like, I guess it would be legit to call it a, an intimidation factor with women and offshore fishing. Um, even though you have tons of kids out there that are asking their mom and dad that they, you know, can we go fishing? I want to catch this kind of fish. And you would see a situation to where, I don't know, it's a single mom or just the mom on vacation or whatever. And she's like, well, I don't know how to do that. Like, are, are, what kind of challenges do you see for women to take a, a family fishing or to go fishing themselves? Um, o- offshore, I, I should say. Yeah, um, I would definitely not even just let the offshore area, but a lot of charter captains and charter boats look scary. <laughs> I mean, like, like if you walk a dock, I mean, some of the boats, they, they look scary. They look old or beat up. Some of the captains don't look very put together. So that's definitely an intimidation factor for a mom to say, well, do I really want to bring my kids around these people? Um, Cause it's no secret. There is a very high drug and alcohol use in the charter fishing world. And so that's definitely one factor that I know when our mom was looking for charter boats to take us out on. She wanted to find someone that she knew she could trust with her kids. Mm-hmm. Um, and then outside of that, I mean, I know that a lot of women are worried about getting seasick. That's a big one. I mean, it's rough out there sometimes. Right. Not to mention the bathroom. Just, women are worried, well, where do I go to the bathroom? Yeah. What do I do if I have to use the restroom? Or if it's yep. rough seas. Um, and we've tried, we don't even have a head on our boat, but we've tried to create an environment where if you have to go, it's no big deal. You use a bucket, you can jump in. And it's really hasn't seemed to be an issue. It's just, you really want to make them comfortable mm-hmm. and tell them like, Hey, I do. It's time. actually funny that when we have guys charter us, they're more uncomfortable to go to the bathroom than the women <laughs> because we're the captain. So with the guys, I'm like, Oh, just go off the back. I'll look forward. And they're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, do, you, do you address that right away? I, I've, I found like, I don't know. I drink a lot of water and coffee. And, and when I was guiding every single day and I had women on board or whatever, I would just say, listen, I just want to tell you right up front, I drink a ton of coffee and a ton of water and I've got to go to the bathroom all the time. I'll let you know, but I just wanted to like set that right away. So it's not like, Oh God, there's going again. Like, you yeah. know, you got to kind of set it. How do you, how do you kind of deal with that? Definitely. Before we leave the dock, I always say there's no head on here. If you want to go before we go, like, that now is the time. If not, no big deal. Go whenever you need to. If you want to jump in, you jump in. You want to use a bucket, use a bucket. And I just say it right up front while we're at the dock. You don't have to leave. normalize it. Yeah. yeah. We're all humans. Like, y'all can use that. You got to go. And, yeah. and But some some ladies will just hold it all day. It's a, it's really remarkable and amazing. I've <laughs> never seen anything quite like it. But, you, you <laughs> I mean, it's like, do you need to go? And everyone else has gone. And... She's just like, no, nope, don't need to, not going to. We're guilty of that. We're guilty of that. I'll hundred percent. I've done that a lot. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. Well, is I can't okay? I can't do that. I I drink lots of water. On it's the, boat. the two of us, or we're with family or woman or kids on the boat, it's no big deal. But there's days where it's all dudes on the boat and we're just like, you know, I'm I'm just too fun today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think I'm I'm good. I just I just won't drink any coffee this morning or water. You said you quit drinking coffee, right? Yeah. Is that one of the reasons why? <laughs> um, it part, was part of it. Yeah. It wasn't all of it. Um, we both have like acid reflux, so it was just easy to say, yeah, it was just quick coffee. Yeah. I, I quit every now and then when I find that it's not like giving me any kind of a, 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 mm-hmm. a bump. Like, and so yeah. Yeah. if you quit for a month and then you start back, oh, yeah. wow. That's yeah. then you realize, yeah. oh, I, now I see why coffee is the the number yeah. one beverage worldwide. It's yeah, pretty I think awesome. It's kind of freeing to not have to rely on caffeine. It is. I mean, and then when you are really tired and you have that's some, you feel great. Do, is exactly. I don't do coffee every day, but if I'm having a tired day, I'll have one. So and it works. And it works, which is my favorite part about it. I know it works yeah. great. I had my, yeah. my story of that is when we were having, uh, my wife and I were having our, our babies um, on the first one. I kind of was so tired and I was drinking so much coffee. And then I decided I was going to quit coffee. And then by the time that the second one came around, I was not drinking coffee at the time. And I remember going to the gas station right across the street from the boat ramp. And I am just dragging. I mean, my son was up all night, not getting any sleep. And I look at the coffee maker. I'm like, I hadn't had coffee in a long time. So I pour like, just like just yeah. this much. And I'm like, I'll just have that much. And I had it and I was like, oh, wow. I feel 
terrific. So the next day it was like this much and the next day it was this much and the next day it was a full cup. And next thing you know, and I'm right back to drinking coffee just like I was before. Yep. Um, it, it happens quick, but when you, when it's out of your system and you have a little bit, it makes a huge difference. Um, all right, cool. Well, um, this was amazing. And, uh, you girls are doing fantastic. Um, and it's, uh, it's no wonder, you know, with the background that you have and your education and your, your discipline and it's, you know, you've got a lot of things going for you and, uh, it's no wonder that you're having great success. So if people wanted to support you and follow you, do what, I mean, maybe even go on a charter with you if, if COVID kind of chills out a little bit, how would they, how would they support everything that you're doing? Um, across the board on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, even TikTok, we're Gale Force Twins, or you can go to our website, galeforcefishing.com, where you will find all of our social media links and some of our video links. And on our website is we have a contact form if you do want to book a charter. We usually have a book a charter form up, which is not up right now, but we have a contact form on our website, which is Gale Force Fishing. And everything else, social media is Gale Force Twins. And the only reason for that is because galeforcefins.com is pagan. <laughs> hmm. Okay. One final question. How are, as twins, and I didn't want to, I didn't want to ask too much about twins because I'm sure you talk about being twins all the time, but uh, okay. you seem pretty comfortable with it. How, um, and we'll start with, let's, let's start with Emily. How are you similar and how are you different than Amanda? And then the same question for you, Amanda. Oh, interesting. Okay, well, we're similar in the way where we're both very driven people. We're really intense people. But that's how are you like me? I'm, I'm pretty oh, okay. That's how we're wait, right? That's how we're yeah. similar. We're both okay. like that. And then, you know, we both thrive under pressure and we're kind of high strong. <laughs> and then I would say we're different where I am more easygoing in our personality. I can go with the flow. <laughs> After I say we're high strong, but it is true between the two of us, I am more easygoing. I go with the flow more. Things get a little stressful. I'm okay. She definitely gets the stress gets to her more. If things aren't as structured, it gets to her more. That's how we're alike and different. Okay, I completely disagree with everything. Uh, depending on the subject, she is more easygoing. But when it comes to work and our business, she is so intense about it. This is the schedule. This is what has to happen. This email has to get sent. She is way more intense about Gale Force Twins. And I'm more easy going about it. It's going to happen. We got to trust the process. We know that over time we're going to grow and it's a natural growing thing. So depending on of life, usually I think I am more stressed. She is more easy going, but except I've got our business. She's just very like, perfect. Um, I think you're more of a no, I don't say that. I say you're more of a perfectionist. Oh, see, I would say she's more of a perfectionist. See, now, now we got to So obviously, out. obviously we could go back and forth all day. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. And so one, one last question. If, if you, uh, like when you're pole vaulters and you're competing against each other, um, there's, there's some friendly rivalry and then there's probably some Pretty, I mean, probably as competitive as you're ever going to be in your life with anyone is probably with with your sister in the exact same event. And now you find yourself in a business together, you know, with a common goal. Do you think that background uh, helps you um, to to work together better? That you've been super competitive with one another before. I think that track was always an individual sport, and it, we were very competitive, and we had a healthy competitive between the two of us. Um, but doing business together, we've had to transition from competitors to teammates. Yeah. And that was actually kind of new for us because we were always doing individual sports, gymnastics, track, pole vaulting. It's all on me and I and do business together. And now all of a sudden we're teammates and it's all on us. That was actually kind of a transition that we weren't really used to. And we had to really start to remember, okay, this is my teammate now. Like, what do we need to do together? And so how's that going? Are you, are you working that out? <laughs> oh yeah. 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 <laughs> now, I would say our first six months to a year working in business together was basically every dynamic as a sibling that we had that wasn't perfect gets amplified tenfold when you're working together. It's one thing to be siblings and have like these issues here and there, but you just blow it off because you're siblings. But then when you're working together, those issues don't go away. 
So we've definitely worked through it and we've had to like remember that when we're working together, we're working together. And when we're siblings, we're siblings. We're siblings. We'll even schedule, we call them sister date nights <laughs> where we'll like Monday night, we're going to go to dinner together and we're not going to talk about work. We're just, just going to enjoy each other's time because, because we live together and we work together and we have the same social, social circle. circle. We work out together. We do everything together, recreational and work related. We kind of had to almost create boundaries between, okay, we're not going to talk about work right now. We're just going to work out and enjoy this workout. Or we're just going to go to dinner and enjoy our friends. And between that, like we, tr- we try, we do hardly ever succeed, but we try after six o'clock, Monday through Friday to not talk about work. We try to put it away. If you have a thought, write it down and talk about the morning. So we've tried to create some boundaries to really remember to be siblings and sisters and then remember to be coworkers too. All right. Well, it seems to be working for you and, uh, I'm, I'm happy for you. It, uh, we need more people just like you too in the, in the fishing industry and people that are, that are concentrating on bringing new people into the sport, especially kids. So I'm, I'm a, I'm a big fan. I think what you're doing is fantastic. Hopefully, hopefully we'll be able to, uh, to go fishing together. That'd be really cool. That'd be awesome. All right. Well, we'll make that happen. We'll make that happen, but thank you very much. Um, and, uh, Everybody, if you uh, if you want to check out some some cool social media and some good videos, go go follow them on all of their platforms, and uh, we will see everybody with another awesome guest next week. So thank you, girls. Thank you.